So Matthew chapter four, verses 23 through uh, 25, and I'll read them for us. It says, and he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. Verse 25, and great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decap uh, De uh, Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. And so just kicking off there in verse 23, it says that Jesus went through all of Galilee. We know from our time together, I've already gone over this, but uh, that I, uh, our time together the last few weeks that Isaiah prophesied that the Messiah would enter into his ministry, would begin his ministry in the region of Galilee. We read that in verses 15 and 16 uh, of this chapter. And that the region of Galilee would see a great light, a spiritual light in darkness. People living in darkness and the shadow of death would see a great light. And this meant they would experience the physical presence of the Messiah in the ministry of the Messiah in the region of Galilee. And what Matthew begins to describe for us here in our verses today is the effects of the light upon the darkness beginning in the region of Galilee. And as I mentioned, the region of Galilee is like... 30, uh, 60 miles by 30 miles. So from here to tri cities about, and then 30 miles wide, you can figure that out in your brain. And according to Josephus, who, by the way, Josephus was, it was the Jewish historian uh, before he was the Jewish historian captured by the Romans. Uh, he was a leader. He was actually called the commander of the Galilee in the Jewish war against the Romans. So he's on the Jewish side and he would fight against the Romans, but he was the commander of the area of the Galilee. And Josephus records for us in his works, uh, the Jewish wars in book three, chapter three, that the region of Galilee, there were about 204 villages. And so there's 204 villages slash towns, whatever you want to call them settlements in and around the area of Galilee. There's 10 major ones, but um, there's 204 spread out And in describing the area of Galilee. He says that because the soil was so rich there, it was really easy to farm, really easy to get make to have food there. So you've got the lake there and you've got all this food. He said there were tons of people. He said the smallest village was around 15,000 people. And some people take the math 15,000 times 204 equals 3 million people. Now, I don't know if that's, that seems like a lot of people between here and tri cities, 3 million people, anybody else. And so, you know, we don't know what he meant by, you know, it could be whatever. Uh, I'm not going to pull you into all the, you know, when you get into academia, you start listening to everybody's different part, arguments about how many people are aware and why they would be. I'm going to leave you out of that discussion this morning and just let you know, there's probably around 400,000 people in the area that could be as many as 3 million, but somewhere around 400,000 in this area and all these villages. And so Jesus had his work cut out for him going to all these places. If you think of Walla Walla, we have something like 65,000 people in our community, somewhere around there. I don't know what the latest census said, but at a minimum 400,000 people living in an area between here and tri city, that's a lot of people and a lot of need and a lot of hurt. <laughs> And Jesus was going throughout all of Galilee to these various towns. And the rest of verse 23 describes what Jesus, the light and the darkness, what he was actually doing. And it says there in verse 23, he was teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Three things you want to note about the ministry of Jesus, what he did. There was a lot that he did, but this kind of sums up when it says that he went preaching repentance, that's a general overarching statement. It gets a little more specific here. Well, what did that look like? Well, three things. He went teaching, he went preaching, and he went healing. These are the three aspects of Jesus's ministry, teaching, preaching, and healing. Teaching, the word in the Greek used here is didasko. It means to impart instruction. It means to instill doctrine, which means teaching. Uh, explain what something means. It's kind of what I'm doing right now to break down a truth into parts, to give people understanding. How many of you are teachers by profession? You understand that just saying something doesn't mean that they're going to understand it. You've got to keep painting a picture and rotating that in a different way until someone gets it. That's what Jesus did for those who had ears to hear. And it says that Jesus was doing this actually in their synagogues. 
We know that Jesus' focus of his earthly ministry was towards the sheep of Israel. Remember, there was the Syrophoenician woman who came to Jesus and she was a Gentile. And there's whole the discussion about giving bread to dogs and all this type of stuff. Jesus was focused on Israel. That's what he came to. That's who he came to first. And then when they rejected him, it went out into the world. But he came to the lost sheep of Israel. That's who he came to. And the synagogue was the epicenter of Jewish life. That is exactly what, where every Jew would go every single Saturday. And not only Saturday throughout the week, it was uh, the synagogue was not only their center for worship and for, uh, you know, on on Saturdays and, and, and teaching, but it was also their educational system. It's where judicial types of things would get resolved. Remember there was no separation of church and state. They didn't have the power to execute people under Rome. And so, although they tend, did like the stone people for some reason. So, but anyways, it was their epicenter. That's where they came together to worship and to be instructed and to give and all these things. And the synagogue was governed by the elders of the people. And there was one elder in particular who'd be over the synagogue. They would be called the ruler of the synagogue. And it was this person who was in charge of Uh, the worship service and they'd be allowed to uh, they'd be the one uh, tasked with uh, managing who is teaching and who wasn't teaching. And so what they had is a very fluid situation with teaching, although they might have some regular teachers there quite often mature men from the, from the congregation could teach or guest visitors could come in and teach if they met certain criteria. And so this is how Jesus came into the situation where he was able to sit in the synagogue and teach. And also Paul, who was a Pharisee and who had all the credentials and all that type of stuff. And that's how they came in. So the ruler of the synagogue let, let them speak. And so we know that the Jews had a worship service on the Sabbath on Saturday and John MacArthur in his commentary, he kind of explains, he breaks down a little bit uh, what that, that, that looked like, what the Jewish work worship service looked like in his commentary in Luke five. It says, first there was Thanksgiving and this was, uh, sandwiched around the Shema, which is, uh, you know, hear our Lord, uh, the Lord, our God, our Lord, our God is one, uh, and, and worship him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Right. And then they would say thanks before and after that. So the first part was that Thanksgiving sandwiched in the Shema and then came a prayer. And so there'd be a prayer. And then a passage of the law was written. So they'd read out of the, uh, somewhere out of the, the old Testament in, in the first five books there, they'd read something out of the law of Moses. And then they would read and it would be translated into Aramaic, which is the language everybody understood. So we read in Hebrew, then in Aramaic, and then they would do something out of the prophets and do the same thing. And then a sermon or exposition or explanation of what was read actually happened. And this is where Jesus would come in or someone else would come in and start explaining the scriptures. And then after that, they'd have the closing, the benediction. So Jesus, as was his custom, he came into the synagogue on the Sabbath and would be given an opportunity by the ruler to expand the scriptures. And so I would go, Hey, you know what? Everybody Christ community fellowship. Our guest teacher this morning is Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Guest teacher. That's a loaded thing. And this is what happens in Luke four. Flip over to Luke four real quickly for me. Verses 18 and 19, Luke four, Matthew, Mark, Luke four. Remember I said that they'd read from something from the old Testament and they read, they read, so from the, obviously from the old Testament, they read from the law and then they read from the prophets. And so it picks up here in verses 18 and 19 of Luke four. It says that Jesus picked up the scroll of Isaiah and he said, and he read the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. And he sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And so Jesus reads from the prophet Isaiah there. And then in verse 20, here's his sermon. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of the synagogue, all the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Can you imagine that? So I walk up here and I, and I read Isaiah and I say, yeah, I'm the fulfillment of that. (laughs) And Jesus 
let them know right then that what Isaiah was prophesying 750 years ago was fulfilled right there in front of them. It was him. He was the one who was anointed. The spirit of the Lord was upon him because God had anointed him to proclaim the good news to the poor. God had sent him to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and set liberty. To those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is what Jesus was doing when he was walking into the synagogues. And no doubt there were more than 204, one for every village and city. There were several more than that. Every time he walked in, he would be expounding like this to the people a great light in darkness. The point is that Jesus came into the middle of their culture, the middle of Jewish culture in the middle. And he would read to them the scriptures. They'd been hearing their entire lives. They had their, their grandparents had been reading generation after generation. They had known the story. How many of you guys like know the story of Jonah? You know, you know the story of Noah, Noah, you go, Oh, I know the story of Samson. And Jesus would come in and he would say, you know what that's about? That's about me. And this is the fulfillment of this. And by the way, he wasn't only doing this in the synagogues. It wasn't just a Sunday situation. As we're going to see next week, he does the sermon on the Mount. He's in people's homes. He's out in fields. He's in the wilderness. He's all over the place. He's on boats. He's preaching. He's teaching. Jesus went about teaching. It says, in, the, in this first part of the ministry of Jesus, teaching the word of God, explaining what God's word says and how we're to respond to it accordingly. But not only was Jesus teaching, and it says, what else was he doing? He's preaching. This is a different word. And this is the word uh, that where we get Caruso. Some of your translations say proclaim. How many of your translations say preaching? How many of yours say proclaiming? Yeah. Different translation trying to say, I like, you know, when you say, you know, preaching, it kind of has a negative connotation in our culture, proclaiming uh, kind of like it's, it's kind of more, it helps us a little bit better, but same thing. It means to herald something, to cry out. So Jesus wasn't sitting there going, you know, two plus two is four because why he was saying two plus two is four. You know, he'd proclaim it and then he'd explain it. So there was preaching and teaching to herald something, to cry out. Strong's Greek lexicon says always with the suggestion of formality, gravity, and authority, which must be listed to and obeyed, Strong says. Jesus came preaching and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Teaching and preaching go hand in hand. That's the way it works. What is proclaimed is explained, and what is explained is proclaimed. Those two things go hand in hand. And they were proclaiming something. What was the message? The gospel of the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus was proclaiming. The gospel, the which gospel means good news. He not only came teaching about the good news, he became, he came preaching and crying out to those living in darkness that there was good news, the good news of the kingdom of God. Listen, the kingdom of darkness does not have any good news, does not have much of it. How many, just check the headlines. How many have been following the news lately? How much of it that is good news? I mean, it depends on your political perspective and that quickly changes because it's bad news because someone else won. But I mean, think about it. Just, just think the, the, the life, the, the world we live in is, is, is marred. It's a kingdom marred by sin and sickness and war and depression and murder and disobedience and all these types of things. I'm not, I'm painting the darkest part of humanity, but I mean, it's all there. It's undergirding everything we have. A kingdom coming to an end, a, king, a kingdom that's degrading. Jesus came proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God, light over darkness, life over death, peace over war, healing over sickness, the power of God over the power of the devil, the power of God over sin and darkness, the power of God over death and evil, a kingdom without end, a kingdom that was growing and would overcome everything. It would never end brought by a king who did not have a beginning and it did not have an end, a Melchizedek, if you, if you would, who came to offer this kingdom to anyone who would repent and believe. Jesus taught the good news. 
He explained what the kingdom was like to those who had ears to hear. But Jesus also came preaching and crying out. And Jesus still is preaching and crying out. But we have deaf ears. We have hardened ears in our society. We have hardened hearts to the things of God. Don't we? Hello? Yes? Yeah. <laughs> But not only did he come just preaching and teaching, so with words, he came with works. He demonstrated the kingdom to people. He didn't only just preach it, he proved it. He proved the kingdom. It's said that he came and he taught in the synagogues and he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among people. Notice every is repeated twice. You know, today, what kind of disease and affliction we we faces us in a community of 65,000 people in Walla Walla Valley. How many of you work in the medical field and are faced with this every single day? The 31 flavors of of pain and suffering and affliction and all this constant suffering that you experience and praise God for you for helping us. Thank you. But Jesus came into Galilee and he, he healed every disease, every affliction. He had complete authority over sin over death, over disease, over sickness, over pain, over demons, over nature. This is what the gospel is explained to us. His authority from a different kingdom that's coming to into this world. I have authority over darkness. Jesus came demonstrating his authority in his words and in his works. And when Jesus was in the home synagogue, his home synagogue in Nazareth, as he's reading that scroll of Isaiah, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. What to proclaim the good news to the poor, good news to the poor. We're going to find out what that it means. And the next chapter, but he, he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that is exactly what was happening. The prophet Isaiah said, there is one coming who is going to shine a light so bright in the face of darkness and death. He's coming. And the healing of disease and the healing of affliction and oppression and all these types of things, that is going to be his calling card. That is how you are going to know it's him. 750 years earlier, he said, this is how you will know it is him because he's going to be like no one else. He's going to have authority over all these things. You know, If you remember in Luke 5, 17 through 26, you can flip over there if you want. Jesus healed a paralytic. It says there that he healed paralytics in our text today. Remember that his, there was a paralytic and his friends like wanted to get him to see Jesus, but the house was so crowded. He couldn't. So they brought him on the top of the roof. They they opened up the thatch thing and they lowered him down. Right. And the Pharisees looked on hand uh, because Jesus says to this man, he says, your sins are forgiven. Now, if someone gets lowered down and they're totally crippled, it doesn't seem like the appropriate response would be your sins are forgiven. Well, that's what was going on. That was why this guy was in the situation. Not all disease and sickness is the result of sin. We know that from other, other scriptures where Jesus, you know, who sinned this man or his father that he's in this condition, no one, but the works of God might be displayed. Right. But in this case, this man had sinned. Some people think he was paralyzed because of a progressive STD. That's all speculation. But the man was paralyzed because of sin. And Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees were looking on there going, no one can forgive sin, but God. Well, how do you know his sins were forgiven? You can't see that. Can you church? Your sins are forgiven. It's like, okay, well that's magical. Thank you very much. 
And Jesus then perceiving what was going on in the hearts, he said out loud, he said, what's it easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk. He says, so that you know that the son of man has authority to forgive sins. Get up and walk. So you know that I have power over both sin and sickness. Get up and walk. And he got up and he ran away. So the teaching was saying only God can forgive sins. That's correct. Who was in the room? (laughs) Son of God. Powerful. The point being that Jesus has authority. Good news. God, Jesus has authority over our sin. He has authority over death. He has authority over whatever else is going on in our lives. You know, in Genesis one, I, we we talk about this and I've talked about this often, but it says, and God said, let there be light. And what happened? There was light. And he goes on that progression in that day and he keeps speaking things and they happen. It says it, it happens. It says it, it happens. It says it, it happens. And what do we learn about God? When God says something, it happens. How's that working out for you guys? For me, I'm going to be more disciplined in diet. (laughs) Didn't happen. Definitely not God here. You know, I'd like you to do X, Y, and Z. I'd like the economy to do X, Y, and Z. No, 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 no power, no authority here. Amen. Anybody else experienced that frustration? Yeah. Jesus walks on the scene and says, you're healed. And what happens? They're healed. He says to a demon, be gone. What happens to the demon? It leaves. He says to the wind waves, be still. And what happens? They're still. He says, Lazarus, come forth. And what happens? Come forth. What's the point? This is God in the flesh. This is Jesus Christ. The one who has power over what we do not. And he taught and he preached and he demonstrated the good news of the kingdom. This is good news. Jesus demonstrated his authority just as the prophet said he would. This is exactly the one the blind are seeing. Remember when, uh, Remember when John the Baptist was in prison and he's having a real hard time. It seems like he has a crisis of faith and he goes, Hey, send someone to Jesus and and ask him, is he really the Messiah? I mean, John's having doubts here as he's having a crisis. John the Baptist, it seems. At least that's how I read it. And Jesus goes back to him and says, what are you seeing? What's going on? Do you see the blind receiving sight? Do you see the lame I have the mute speaking to the deaf hearing again. Do you see all these things? Yeah, that's me. That's the one the prophet spoke of. I am in your presence. So Jesus came into Galilee. It says in verse 24, as he does all this stuff. So his fame spread throughout all Syria and they brought him all the sick and those afflicted with various diseases. So this went beyond from here to tri cities. It went into Hermiston and went out to Pendleton and went over to Yakima went on to all these other places. This fame spread throughout all Syria and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics and he healed them. Matthew gives us a glimpse into that power that Jesus displayed in his healing. It says in verse 24 that they brought him all the sick. This is a general category, all the sick. And then Jesus healed those afflicted with various diseases and pains. How many of you have a various disease and pain going on in your life or in someone you love? Anyone else? I just took a two seconds, heart disease, cancer, fibromyalgia, glaucoma, diabetes, dementia, ALS, MS, STDs, mental illness. I mean, you've, you've been going, Hey Matt, you left out. Of course I did. And then the pains associated with all these things. We got pains going on in your body. You know, some of these things are the results of poor decisions. Yep. Bad habits. Some are genetic. Some are from 
the environment. Some are the result of sin. Some are from getting old. Some are not. Some are that God might be glorified somehow. I don't know. And these diseases comes with various pains. You know, like I've mentioned before, I have fibromyalgia. I'm just using myself as an example. But, and man, I don't wish this on anyone. Constant fatigue and pain and brain fog and emotional challenges and all this type of stuff that goes on with it. I'm sure you can fill in the blanks with your own situations or your loved one next to you or people, you know, that are struggling deeply and how you feel powerless over those situations. And we go to the best we have and they help a little bit, but you know what? It's like, ugh. you know, it's a downward spiral. Sorry, painting the picture black here. <laughs> and then there's the demonic aspect. He says all diseases, but then he talks about affliction. There's a demonic aspect of various afflictions, sickness and afflictions and conditions brought about by demonic things, demonic forces and influences upon a person, things we cannot see. We see examples of in scripture of people having seizures of people uh, running around naked and mumbling things and cutting themselves and Uh, people being mute and throwing themselves into a fire and all this type of weird stuff of having extreme power and attacking people and all this kind of stuff. You know, we, we, we're very quick to minimize anything that would be involved with the demonic these days, you know, mass, the mass shootings that are going on, you know, we, we chalk all of this up to mental Ill, mental health. And I have no doubt there's, there's mental illness going on there. I'm not minimizing that whatsoever. But in many of these cases, people are hearing voices that are telling them to do these things. What do you think that is? Who do you think that is? Listen, we, we have a spiritual enemy. We have a spiritual problem in this country that we try to just gloss over. You know, it's, it, you know, you can put red flag laws and I think we need to to do what we can to, you know, be smart about things. And and I don't want to get into gun control and stuff. Yes. I'm locked and loaded and all that good stuff, but man, that's just not going to stop the enemy from doing what he's doing to people. I mean, we are reaping Man, what's the answer? More medication, lock these people away, all that kind of stuff. I'm not saying that everything has a demonic background to it. Everything is, everything's a demon. Everything's the result of sin. But there is a spiritual war going on. There's a real enemy and we are beginning to actually see the manifestation of this coming out more aggressively in every way in our society. It's becoming bold. It's no longer camouflage behind the scenes. And Jesus comes into a very dark world where there is brutal sickness, unchecked by medicine, anything where there's brutal demonic oppression, where there are just crazy stuff going on in society and he is mastering it all. This is our Lord. This is Jesus. He's freeing captives from the hold of the enemy from physical things, from all this kind of stuff. And what Matthew is pointing out is that Jesus is the one, the one the world needs to point to. We're so quick to go to to medicine or to whatever it might be. Jesus is the answer. Ultimately. Yes. I mean, I'm wearing glasses right now. I don't believe, you know, I'm thankful for medicine and all these types of things, but I'm just saying it's like, let's, let's, let's remember This is a, this is a dark world and let's not be lulled to sleep by the enemy. Jesus is the Messiah. Matthew's point. He's the son of God, God in the flesh. And he's teaching and proclaiming and demonstrating the good news of the kingdom of God. This really happened. This happened. 
power over sin and death and everything in, every, everything in between. To those living in darkness and the shadow of death, a great light has dawned. Now, all of this is so important. And, and, and we, we need to also remember, while we're looking at the healing ministry of Jesus, we need to make sure we don't take the healing ministry out of context. Yes, it was miraculously. Yes, we stand in awe of his power and marvel of the ministry that went on through him and his apostles. And I believe can still continue on in the church today. That's where I stand on that. But what's the point? Everybody Jesus healed died. Do we know that? Everybody that Jesus miraculously healed, he died. They went on to die again. Lazarus died. These the guy who was paralyzed, yay, he ran around for a few more years and he died. The apostles went around. I, I know this is like, what's the good news, man? <laughs> I was trying to get you to depressed for 4th of July. Everybody died. What's the point? The point is looking beyond. The point is every person died and they experienced, even they, though they experienced the, the hands, the miracle at the hands of the apostle. And let me say that so many are today are offering the temporary. They're offering the temporary and Jesus came and he, his point in healing people and all this stuff was yes, because he wanted to show God's favor to them, but they would all die. He wanted to see them to see beyond their current circumstances. Amen. He wanted them to look beyond their suffering, beyond their sickness, beyond their need for food, beyond temporal life for real life, which he possessed and give and could give them. So the point of Jesus demonstrating the power of the kingdom isn't just to heal people physically and emotionally for them just to die. The point of all the healing is that people would believe upon him. The power, the healing power of Jesus was to lead us to faith. And Jesus says this, John 14, 11, check it out. Jesus says to Philip, remember Jesus says, show, uh, Philip says, show us the father, right? And Jesus says, have I been with you so long? You don't recognize me. And then he says in verse 11, he says, believe me that I am in the father and the father is in me or else believe on the account of the works themselves. Look at all this stuff I'm doing. I'm showing you I'm God. Listen, Philip, believe what I say. Just look at the works. They all back it up. I am who I'm saying I am. And so our heart longs to be healed. How many of you long to be healed? I'm tired of hurting anyone else. But what we truly long for is him. What we truly long for in our lives is not temporal life, but eternal life. What we truly long for is a new body. What we truly long for is not a temporal earth a permanent earth, the new kingdom. We long for him. And even the works that God did through the apostles were to the same end, not just to heal people, but to point people to Jesus. That's the point of it all. Look at the example of Acts 19, where it says in the beginning, I'm just going to read this to you in verse one. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their disease left them and the evil spirits came out of them. I mean, what? That's crazy. Now, this is some kind of miraculous deliverance, some kind of power that God was exercising through Paul. And notice people try to mimic that today. Anybody got an advertisement about it? Special water, special handkerchief, all this kind of stuff. They just want your money. Yeah. If we stop here, we get a weird theology. Keep reading. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. And so they had Jewish exorcists, the sons of Sceva. And they, they tried to do this thing. They said, I adjure you by the, by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims, like come out of him according to the Jesus that Paul knows. And what happens? The seven sons of, they, they, they were doing that. And then verse 15 says, but the evil spirit answered them and says, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house, naked and wounded total demonic power. The enemy knew the real deal and they weren't it. (laughs) 
But here's the key verse. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks and fear fell on all of them. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. That is the point of the miracles and the powers that the name of Jesus Christ would be extolled, not the name of Matt or Christ community fellowship, that Jesus would be extolled and feared. And also many of those who were believers came confessing and divulging their practices. Believers were repenting of their sin. And a number of those who had practiced magical arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. And so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Work. It's not for our namesake. It's for his name. And if God were to graciously heal you, know that that is a special thing and that God would seek for you, not to just relish in your healing, but to believe upon him that others would look upon him and, and see him and turn from evil and repent and have true life. You know, I pray that God would be merciful to us today, that he would heal. I haven't seen any miraculous healings. I've prayed for people and they've gotten well overnight, you know, and I know God had mercy upon people. I've seen that kind of thing happen. And I've heard of works being done overseas. I don't know the validity of them all. And some people say God's done. Listen, God can do whatever he wants whenever he wants. He's God. But be careful and discerning when it comes to those who claim to have the power to heal. Just be careful. Okay. Because we know in according to second Thessalonians two, seven through 12 about the deception that's headed our way. It says there for the mystery of the lawless one is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he's out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing. The appearance of his coming. He's speaking about the antichrist is going to come on the scene in verse nine. It says then the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth. And so be saved. The devil is a powerful demonic angel. And he similar to Moses throwing down his snake. He's got his magicians that always try to counterfeit the power of God. False signs, false wonders. You know, I believe God's still very much in the business of healing and freeing captives, you know, and maybe you're overwhelmed with sickness this morning. You need God to, you know, ask for God to heal you. You know what the scriptures say about that in the new Testament, the commands that I've looked at before outside of the book of acts. This is any of you sick. (laughs) Come to the elders. Confess your sin, let him anoint you with oil. Let him pray for you. How many of you have taken the opportunity to do that in your, in your affliction and sickness? How many have we had Gary over the years? One or two. Maybe that's our fault for not sharing that with you. You know, I take that upon myself. Maybe God would heal you. It's not that we have special powers. This, this is what God says. Maybe you have some, and and by the way, the idea there, I think is that there might be some discernment in that group to find out what might be going on. Pray for one another, confess your faults to one that you might be healed. So we're available for you to come and, 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 and to pray for you, to lay hands on you, to ask God to be merciful, to lift something off of you. You know, and if God is sovereign, he wants to do that. Amen. It's not going to be like, you know, some weird words and all that stuff, but we just pray and we ask for God's will in the matter. Amen. And he gets the glory, but beyond that, there's a greater healing that needs to happen. And this is the most important thing, not the temporal healing, but the eternal healing that you would have real whole, full everlasting life. 
And it all comes down like that. If Ephesus thing, God's going to confront you over your darkness. He's going to call you to give it up and to turn to him and believe upon him. And he'll do that work in your heart. Repent and believe upon Jesus. Let him do the greatest miracle, the greatest work in your heart. It's not a work that's all flashy and everybody sees. It's a work that he did when he got totally crushed because of his deep love for you. Let him in. Let him in. Let him give you life. That's the greatest miracle. Jesus is still at work today, church. There's a lot here that needs to be unpacked and there's a lot of questions, but I think that's where we're going to leave it. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis in Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the, the Jordan, all over Israel, people started to follow him. So his fame starts to come up because man, I want to have healing. Who else wants to have healing? Amen. But Jesus would feed the thousands and then they would try to kill him because they just wanted the temporary. So he who has an ear to hear, let him hear it. Man, this is good news. He loves you. God loves you. He knows where you're at. And God can be merciful to you this morning. May, may he heal you. I pray he does. But if he doesn't, hold fast, trust in the promises that he has for you. That's much richer than whatever's going on today. Paul says something about light and momentary afflictions compared with the eternal weight of glory. Think about that. How bad are your light afflictions compared to the eternal weight of glory? Amen. I can't wait for the weight. That's going to be an awesome weight. If this is light and momentary and it's only getting wonderfuler, <laughs> man, the eternal weight. And that's what he has for us in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I just uh, I want to thank you so much for Jesus coming on the scene. I thank you for the power that he demonstrated in the words he taught and the works he wrought, Lord. And I just ask that you continue that work in this fellowship. I pray that where the enemy has been at work, you'd break his power. I pray that where lies have been dispelled, Lord, you would bring truth. I pray that our hearts would be bare before you, that you would be ruling and reigning here, and that you'd bring peace to our hearts. Thank you so much, Lord, for your love. Thank you for the love you've put in our hearts now that we have for one another. Thank you for doing that, for bringing the good news. Lord, how many of us were just so out of our minds before we knew you, and yet you've done such a deep and profound work. Thank you for the love you've given us for you and for one another. Grow it more in this place, God. May people marvel at your work alone. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.